NSF, the National Science Foundation in US says the average graduating PhD student is under 105,000 US dollar debt. That goes against the general notion that PhDs are well-funded program in US. If these are the well-funded programs, then how come these graduating students have such a high debt on their shoulders? Well, PhDs are indeed very well-funded programs in the US, but not all of them, not in all the subjects. Generally, the STEM-related PhDs tend to have the more funding opportunities in the US. But what about other subjects like fine, fine arts, humanity, agriculture, economics, geology, education, and other subjects? Well, you can still find financial support in all these subjects, but you need to know the right approach, the right method. So in this video, I'll go over the general admission process for the PhDs in US universities. And most importantly, how you can land on a fully funded PhD program, regardless of the subject that covers your full tuition fees, your health insurance, and monthly stipend. So let's get started. When I was in India and planning for my PhD in the US, I had so many questions about PhD. How to start? When to start? What is the right time? What is the right method? And there was no one to answer my questions. There was no even a YouTube channel that time. So my motive to make this video is if you are planning to start your PhD in US universities in near future, you should not face all those difficulties that I faced. So very first tip to you is, if you want to land in a fully funded PhD program in US universities, you gotta start ahead of time. A general rule of thumb is, you need to start 1.5 year ahead of the start of the program. It means if you are planning to apply for the fall 2023, you are already late. You don't have any time to waste. Now, when it comes to application process, you basically have two approaches. Approach A, you go online, fill up the application form for any university, send your TOEFL score, GRE score, send your LORs, SOPs, transcripts, course evaluations, and wait for the decision. That's a typical approach. Majority of students do that. And that works, but there's another approach that works better. Approach B, which on the other hand, starts from contacting the professor in any university before you start your application process. Engage with him or her in a discussion. Open up a dialogue, and that has many advantages, by the way. First, if the professor is in the admission committee, he can really recommend you for the admission. Two, if he is not in the admission committee, but he can still know somebody who is in the admission committee and refer your resume to that other professor. Three, if he thinks that your credentials are not good enough for the PhD admission, he would let you know and that will save you money and effort that you would otherwise take in applying that university. And four, if professor just ignores your email, you will still learn how to accept the rejections. Oh, just kidding. I mean, this is also a part of life, but it can also happen. So you have to be ready for that too. Back to the point, it's really helpful to start contacting professors before you start the application process. And this typically approach works very well for Europe as well if you want to apply PhD in Europe. Now, how to write, what to write, when to write, all these things can make or break your chances. My next video is in fact on this topic, so stay tuned. 12 years ago when I was in your shoes, I was applying for PhD program in the US. This is how I started. I shortlisted 50 universities from the list of top 200 universities in the US. You can use any ranking for example, Times ranking or US News ranking, that doesn't matter. What matters is how you shortlist 50 universities. If you already know what you want and how do you shortlist the university, that's very good. Otherwise, I have a video for you that might be very helpful. Now, when you are shortlisting the universities, keep the following points in your mind. Number one, the, any prerequisite courses required for the PhD program. Number two, the TOEFL cutoff score. Number three, the average GRE score. Number four, if you have a three-year bachelor's degree, make sure that the university is accepting three-year bachelor's degree. Because in the US, many universities do not accept three-year bachelor's degree. So that is very important point. And last but not the least, the acceptance rate in that university is also important to some extent. 
it's not super important, super crucial, but if you keep that in mind, you will increase your chances of ac acceptance into that university. After I shortlisted 50 universities, I went over each and every university's website. I looked into the physics department because I was a physics student and I shortlisted three professors from each university. I ranked them based on my choice, my first preference, second preference and third preference. And I started contacting the professors. And this is the hard part. I know this is the hard part, but you have to go through it. You have to put some efforts. That's why I said start early. And in parallel, I was also preparing for my GRE, my TOEFL. I was working on my SOP and as well as I talked to my recommenders. So I was preparing for the second part of approach B. So as I said, approach B has two parts. Number one, contacting the professors and number two, work on your SOP, LORs and other stuff. So you have to work on both the parts parallelly. Now some universities might ask you to submit your music album or video album and so on, especially if you are applying for music related or fine arts related PhDs. Whereas on the other hand, if you are applying for a management PhD, universities might ask you for in-person interview or online interview. So be prepared for that. You have to prepare that in parallel too. Now once I was done with that, in the first round, I sent out carefully drafted email to my first choice of professors in all those 50 universities. It took me almost month and a half because you cannot just send an email to each and every professor without even thinking. You have to tailor your email according to professor's research, his area of interest. Expert tip here is send an email from your official email ID. It's very common in IITs in India, students have their official email ID. Whereas non-IIT student might not have one, so they usually use either Gmail or Yahoo. And the emails sent from email Yahoo or Gmails can go to spam folders and that's the only risk. So if you have one, an official email from your university, please do use that to send out email to professors. Again, do watch my next video which is coming very soon. I will discuss all these things in detail. If you really enjoyed the video until now, please subscribe to the channel and gently tap on the notification bell icon. Thank you. From the 50 emails that I sent out in my first round, I got about 40% replies. I'm not sure about how many exactly because it was like 13 years ago, but the reply uh, percentage was quite high. Some replies were negative, others were neutral and some were diplomatic which I still don't know what they meant. But four replies were really very, very positive, very optimistic. And one of the professor even asked me to put his name in my SOP. And that was really, really very encouraging for me. I, without wasting any more time, I immediately started my application process for those four universities. And in parallel, I started the second round of emails where I sent out emails to the professors in the universities that have never replied back to me in my first round of emails. Again, after a few days, I got one more positive reply and I applied to that university. So in total, I applied to five universities where I got the reply from professor, a positive reply, plus I applied one more university, so a total six universities. Typically, universities start sending offer letter in February or mid-February and onwards. So uh, I also received the offer letters during February to April. Some universities send admission offer first and the uh, financial offer later, whereas other universities will only promise you financial aid for the first semester or for the first year. And with the promise to subsequently extend your financial aid on a condition basis if you maintain minimum GPA. And it also depends upon whether you are receiving a teaching assistantship, research assistantship or scholarship. The point I am making here is it really depends upon what kind of financial aid you are receiving. The offer may vary from university to university, from course to course, and from financial aid type. Now, out of the six universities that I applied, I got offer from four universities. Three universities with full financial support and one without any support. The financial support included full tuition fee waiver, health insurance, the mandatory health insurance, and of course, the monthly stipend. Now, once the offer is received, the rest is easy. You basically have to get your I-20, apply for the visa and fly to US. In case you need more information, by the way, I have videos on all those topics. Now, I also got rejection from two universities during the same time. Why? 
because contacting professor before you start the online application is one part of the application. There are tips, basic rule of thumbs, your LOR, SOP, resume, whole new gambit. These all things matter. In my future videos, I will elaborate more on those topics, particularly the mistakes that you must avoid in your PhD application. Also keep in mind, it's not mandatory for all the universities to start contacting professors. For example, in my last video, I talked about Princeton universities where you don't have to contact the professor before you send the application because Princeton is one of the universities that guarantees full financial support for all the PhD students. So in those universities, you don't have to mandatorily start contacting professor before the application. However, starting a conversation with professor has all its other benefits which I talked about in the beginning. So it does not harm to contact a professor, but it's not mandatory for certain universities. One more tip here is many students who apply for PhD program, they also apply for master's program as well, just to cover the risk. Because PhD admissions are generally very competitive. And especially if you have only bachelor's degree in your home country, it could be really competitive. And if you have only three years of bachelor degree, it can make it even more competitive. So keep in mind, because if you apply for master degree, which typically is easier to get in, you can always come here, finish your master degree, and then apply for PhD. Rest of the things are same. Now, extracurricular activities. Many students ask me about the extracurricular activities for the PhD program. Now, in the PhD program, the extracurricular activities are not that important as they are important in the undergraduate admission. PhD is mostly the research program. Unless you have an extracurricular activity that is based on research, for example, you have published a paper or you have a patent or you have done an extra research which was not a part of your curriculum in master's program, then it is really helpful. But if you have some other extra activities that might not carry any weightage in the PhD process. Because in PhDs, the greater emphasis is given on research-based extracurricular activities or research-based skills. GRE score. A good GRE score will not going to get you into the program, but a bad GRE score can really keep you out. So you have to make sure that you cross a certain level of GRE. The perfect GRE score is not required. It's not required at all. Whereas on the other hand, TOEFL score has a hard cutoff, so you have to cross that cutoff score. If you score more than 102 in TOEFL, you will be above the cutoff line for most of the universities. Well, that's all for today. That's my story. It really worked out for me and I'm sure this approach, if you are diligent, will work for you as well. And last but not the least, if you ever want to reach out to me, DM me on my Insta at Flight Education. And that's perhaps the only and the fastest way to reach out to me. Good luck with your PhD application and let me know your experiences in the comments below.